Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Korlick with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and as I'm sure you're incredibly sick of hearing about it, but don't worry, you won't hear it anymore. I recently went to Japan, and uh, so I got to check out a bunch of cool stuff, including weird things like this. This is Japanese cheesecake getting made. Look how fluffy and weird it is. Uh, I heard a lot about it. Actually, I didn't really like it that much. It tastes like scrambled eggs. It's kind of strange. Um, but anyway, uh, I went to a lot of book-offs. Now, you guys might be familiar with book-off. You might have heard about it. It's, uh, it's very common in, in Japan. It's a chain. Now, there's like 12 of them in Osaka, in the greater Osaka area, and I'm very proud to say that I managed to get to all all of them. It was nuts. The sad part, though, is a lot of the footage I shot at Book Off, or various Book Offs, got corrupted and doesn't work. So I have only a few of like what they looked like on the outside, and then this particular one that you're seeing a sign of right now, this was pretty much the only one where the footage I shot inside survived. Uh, and then just a couple of other random clips from other Book Offs survived. So I do apologize, but trust me, I'm more pissed off about it than you are. But they basically generally look like this. Uh, they'll have old soft sections, which is referring to old software or older games, retro stuff, uh, a lot of SNES, N64, and stuff like that, um, Mega Drive, and then they always have a giant PS2 section, PS3 section, Wii section, Xbox section, uh, there's always GameCube stuff, DS, you know, a lot of what you would expect. Um, and the thing that makes Book Off more interesting, though, is that they're completely inconsistent in their prices. Like, you can find a really rare item that's super, super cheap, or you can find a super common thing that's oddly expensive. And you go to one store, and it might be 108 yen, which is about a buck. Or you can go to another store, and they have the exact same item for, like, you know, 1,000 yen, which is, like, 10 bucks. It, it's, it's, it's completely all over the place. But it, it's pretty fun to check out. They usually take credit... Actually, they all take credit cards. Some of them do the whole tax-free thing. Some of them don't. It's, it's a complete you know crapshoot man but it, it's it is fun to venture around they also of course have books and comics and uh dvds blu-rays but none of that interested me because i don't speak japanese they also had this thing caught my eye it was some sort of one terabyte like hard drive or modem or something for the ps4 i never really figured that out if anybody knows please tell me i'm very curious um they all have bargain bins like this just full of whatever this caught my attention, an American imported in television, which was, like, really expensive. And then they had things like this, a Japanese Saturn for, like, $9. It just it was like, dude. Um, and then look at this, a whole bin of Zelda for the 64. 500 yen a piece. That's, like, 4 bucks for each of those. Look at that, every single one. It is a common over there. It's like a sports game. It's insane. But anyway, that was a quick look at Book Off, and uh, that, is, that, like I said, will be the final in the whole Japanese store tours thing I've been doing here. Um, obviously, we're going to do pickups here in a moment, but uh, I just want to take a second here to thank you guys for watching this and kind of putting up with the gorilla style footage that I had to shoot in most cases. You guys are the best, but pickup time. This isn't even everything. There's stuff off to the side you guys aren't seeing that will be at the end of the video. Um, so yeah, if you don't care about anything else I have to say, I'm basically just going to review Book Off a little bit. If you don't care about that, you just want to see pickups, feel free to skip to this time code somewhere. Uh, but yeah, man, obviously I killed it <laughs> at Book Off. That place was crazy. So the thing about Book Off, though, is it actually made like a horrible first impression on me. I went to one near uh, Den Den Town, near Super Potato, and I walked in, now, as the title implies, it's primarily a bookstore, right? but they have a video game section. That one had one, but it was all modern stuff, and it wasn't really very well priced. And I was like, oh, is this what everyone makes a big deal about? Because Book Off is well known in the West to uh, basically collectors and stuff, because it's like, well, that's such a cool store, I definitely wanna check those out. In fact, we even have a few of them in the States now. There's some in California, there's like one in New York. Um, obviously those are different, they would carry American products, but it's a chain that's kind of expanding, and a lot of people know about it. So obviously I wanted to check it out, as well as I wanted to check out Hard Off. Hard Off is like the sister uh, city, or sister uh, company, and uh, store chain, whatever. And uh, unfortunately there's none of them in Osaka, and none really nearby uh, it either. Like the nearest one was like a two hour train ride away in like a rural area. I just wasn't confident I could actually function out there, which is too bad because Hard Off focuses more on uh, hardware, as the title would imply. So it's it's like a lot of game consoles as well as like, you know, radio parts, you know, just all sorts of just stuff. I would have loved to have gone to one, but the opportunity just was not there. But Book Off itself, like I said, first impression was kind of bad, but then I went to what I affectionately call Chinatown, and I'm not saying that as some sort of ignorant <laughs> term. 
that whole area is nothing but Chinese people. And I mean that literally. You can hear Mandarin being spoken all the time. Um, like, I don't speak Japanese, I don't speak Mandarin, but I can understand them. Like, I can understand what is being spoken. Mandarin is very easy to identify, and it's everyone there is speaking it, because the whole area is designed to attract Chinese tourists, so it makes perfect sense. Um, and so, yeah, I went to one of those, I went upstairs, it was like a two-floor deal, and I was wandering around, and um, I noticed the old soft section had a ton of N64 cards. Now, going over there, I didn't really care about N64 stuff, I, I wasn't really on my list, but then I'm flipping through just for the fuck of it, and I notice, like, oh, that's an exclusive, that one, that one, that one, like, these are all exclusives, and they're all, like, 108 yen, which is a buck, and I'm just like, fuck, so I, like, I got, like, 10 of them off the list that I didn't have until that moment for 10 bucks, you know, and that started the problem, <laughs> and then, of course, it didn't help that a lot of those stores, a lot of book-offs, especially in that area, uh, in the cities themselves, not so much the rural parts, will do, um, t uh, give you the tax-free thing, and, of course, they all accept credit cards. I'd love to explore more of that and give you guys more information, but I'm thinking, and you guys let me know if you want this, I'm thinking about doing a live stream where I just talk about what it was like going to Japan, travel tips, how to save money here and there, some good stores, like all that kind of stuff. And it has some sort of live Q&A, and then of course after that breaks down, we do a regular Q&A. You let me know if that's interesting to you. Tell me in the comments. Otherwise, let's just proceed with the pickups at this point. So, as aforementioned, I killed it on N64 stuff, even though I had no intention of doing that. By the end of this trip, I counted it all up, I walked away with 58 N64 exclusives. Now I want you to understand, my ceiling price on N64 stuff was 500 yen, that's about 4 bucks. So I never paid above that. There were games I found that were exclusives that were more than that, I did not get them. I only got the cheap ones. Most of them were either 108 yen or 250 yen, which is about a buck about two and a half dollars, not not even that much, like two dollars, twenty cents, something like that. Or again, at maximum 500 yen, which is about four bucks. So, there you go. Here, let's, uh, this is what I ended up getting from Book Off. We got J League Live 64. Um, Itoi Shigasato No Bass Tsuri number one Kete, Ketehan, it's a fishing game. Custom Robo which uh, I believe this franchise later came out on the GameCube in North America. Onigai Monsters. Uchan Nanchan no Nano no Challenge Denru Era Era Bo. Doesn't mean it's going to make sense. Oh, this one was really interesting. Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 Odo Kaisho. The reason this game was really interesting to me is I popped it in, and it's a wrestling game, and when I popped it in, it was like, this looks so familiar. Why is this so familiar? And then I realized it instantly. This is WrestleMania 2000 for the N64, completely reskinned with Japanese wrestlers. It's surreal. Like, the intro is exactly the same, but instead of, you know, Triple H, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and The Rock, it's Japanese wrestlers. It's, it, it's, and the animations are identical, the music's the same. If you liked WWF WrestleMania 2000 for the N64, pick this up. It is exactly the same game, all different characters. It's fascinating. In fact, there's another one of those, uh, wrestle, uh, there's Virtual Pro Wrestling 1, which I'm not certain, but it might be a reskin of a different one. At first I thought No Mercy, but that game came out after WrestleMania 2000, so I doubt they went in the reverse order over there. I don't know, though. It, it's, it was really weird. Um, maybe it was like WCW, NWO, whatever that game was, Revenge. Could be that one. I'm not sure. Um, Psycho Habu Shogi, some sort of puzzle game. Uh, Puyo Puyo in Party. I had no idea there were Puyo Puyo games on the 64. Mahjong 64. 64 Ozumo, Django Simulation Mahjong Do 64, I can't read Japanese, I, I printed the labels in English on the side, and that's how I'm reading them, Jinsai Game 64, this is essentially, if you guys ever play that board game, The Game of Life, or just Life, that, I want to, I don't, I hesitate to call it a franchise, but that franchise is retardedly popular over there. Like, not only did they have a ton of games based on it, they have merch. And I mean, like, weird merch. 
like ice cream bars. It's fucked up. I had no idea that that board game was that popular over there, but that board game has had like iterations on like every console over there. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's really strange. Uh, J Jikyo J League Perfect Striker. Uh, you have to be careful with these J League Perfect Striker games. Some of these got brought over as different names over here. Others did not. Um, uh, Fushigi, Dun Fushigi no Dungeon, Furino Shiren to Onshurai Shiren Jo. Oh, some of these names are brutal, man. Uh, Mahjong Master. Derby Stallion 64, which is a horse racing game. Derby, as in racing, not Dobby, again, as in the British city. Eh? The British city. Uh, 64 de Hakin Tamagotchi Mina de Tamagotchi World. I think it has something to do with Tamagotchis. 64 Trump Collection. How odd. Alice no Waku Waku Trump World. This has something to do with Alice in Wonderland, and I doubt it's Donald Trump, <laughs> but it's, it's some sort of Trump Collection, which is clearly some sort of board game, like a card game collection. Um... Famista 64, some sort of baseball game. Uh, Mahjong Horokai Classic. You look at the artwork of this one. When I first saw this, I was like, oh shit, this looks like some sort of fighting game. It just looks like a cover of a, you know, something you'd see on a Neo Geo platform. Like, these people are about to throw down and beat some shit. No, they're about to throw down some fucking Mahjong pieces. Yeah, that's fucking badass. Um... Doraemon 3, Nobi Dai No Mochi SOS. There's a, there's a bunch of, uh, there's three Doraemon games on that console. Uh, I believe they're platformers, although I'm not 100% on that. Custom Robo V2. Again, the Custom Robo franchise eventually made it over here on the GameCube. AI Shogi 3. It's worth noting that obviously a lot of the games we didn't get are puzzle games, like Japanese centric ones, like Mahjong stuff, so it makes perfect sense. Jikyo Powerful Pro Yaku 2000, uh, a baseball game. Uh, Pro Mahjong Kiwame 64. Hamster Monogatari 64. Jikyo Powerful Pro Yaku 5. Doraemon Nobita to Tsu no Sirai Ishii, which is actually the first one. It says three in the title, but it's not the third one. It's the third one I already mentioned. 64 Ozumo 2. Jikyo Powerful Pro Yaku 4. J League 11 Beat 1997. Powerful League 64. Chokukan Night Pro Yaku King. Wonder Project 2. Haiwa Pachinko World 64. Nushi Tsuri 64. Virtual Pro Wrestling 64. This is the other one I was talking about. This might be WCW NWO Revenge. I'm not sure. Because I wasn't as familiar with that one. Last Legion UX. Doraemon 2, Nobita to Hirkari no Shinden. Jikyo Powerful Pro Yaku 6. And finally, St. Andrew's Old Course, which is obviously some sort of golf game. Then I decided to pick up some Super Famicom games. Now, despite what you see behind me, I've, I, I love the Genesis. I love the Super Nintendo, a.k.a. Super Famicom, as it was over there. Um, but I've never really wanted to collect much for it because they're... Games for that are really hard to find, they're really expensive, they're usually in bad shape. It's just, as much as I love them, I've never really wanted to collect too much for them. Uh, so what that means is, when it comes to the Super Famicom, I'm not too familiar with its exclusives library, so I didn't really put much thought into it. But then it occurred to me, like, you know, you do have three Super Famicoms and almost no games for them. You probably should get something. And I tackled that in a different video, but I kind of mentioned that around James. And he recommended a few games to me on that basis, saying these are exclusives, these are good, these are playable, even if you, you know, don't speak Japanese, so here's what you got. Um, so for the most part, that's probably true. This one is 
Bishoju Senshi Sailor Moon S Kondu no Puzzle de Orokai Yo. Essentially, this is a Sailor Moon puzzle game. There's apparently four Sailor Moon games on the Super Famicom. Two of them are fighting games, one's a puzzle game, and one's an RPG. The RPG is the rare one, apparently. Um, <clears throat> I got Super Puyo Puyo Tsu Remix 2. Poppin' uh, Twin Bee Rainbow Bell Adventures. Some sort of Konami game. Uh, this is one of the fighting ones. This is uh, Bishu Senshi Sailor Moon S. Like I said, just a fighting game. Uh, and then this one is Great Battle 4, which I believe was some sort of platformer. Uh, now this last one I really hesitated to get for a, a few different reasons, but at the same time I really wanted it, so it was, it was kind of a rock and a hard place. Um, this is Super Back to the Future 2. Now as you can see, this cartridge has seen better days. Um, now, this game was never released in the West. It was only released in Japan for the Super Famicom, and it, even over there, it's actually very hard to find. Um, now, in this case, um, well, you can see the cartridge is beat to shit. But Book Off is selling it for 500 yen, which is like four bucks. And even, the game is retardedly expensive, so I really didn't want to pay for it, even when I did find it in certain stores. But the thing is, the cartridge is kind of funky, and I, I kind of think it's a pirate cart. Um, which would ex possibly explain the really bad label, but I, I don't know. So I picked it up, even though it's probably not legitimate, but for four bucks, whatever. It's not like I was ever going to get a better deal than that, so I got it. But anyway, so that's it for regular Super Famicom stuff. Now on to weird special Super Famicom stuff. Now they had an add-on for the Super Famicom that we never had called the Satellaview. Uh, it was basically allowed you to connect the console to Nintendo servers and do all sorts of additional things, including download games and stuff like that. I did a video on it kind of a while back. Um, now, there were certain games that they released for the Super Famicom that were enhanced by it, and they're funky-looking cartridges. Because the servers no longer exist, these games don't do anything special anymore, and therefore not really worth a damn. So I found three of them super cheap, and I already had two of them to begin with, so there's only like eight, so I have the majority of them now. Um, but I picked up the ones I could find. This is um, Shingatsato Itoi's number one bass fishing. You might have noticed, if you were paying attention, the sequel to this is on the N64, and I have it in this pile over here. But as you can see, they're bigger cartridges, kind of like a Super Game Boy. They have, they have a slot very similar, except that the pins are totally different. Um, and you would put a cartridge in there, and it would download data and change the game and stuff like that. Uh, this one is called SD Gundam G Next. Uh, for re just for the record, you can still play these without that connectivity. It just lacks additional features. Uh, and then this game is called Same Game. This one I was excited to see for two reasons. One, just to find us a television game, but also because this one actually has like the data cartridge with it. It's just a weirder looking cartridge with a completely different pinout on the bottom. Uh, I don't, I couldn't possibly tell you what specifically this game does with that cartridge, I don't know, but it was interesting. It's got a picture of Bomberman on it, so maybe that's worth something notable. Uh, but anyway, so that's it for Super Famicom stuff. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, Book Off, typically, depending on where you are, will honor the whole no tax thing. So I was with James, and we were at a store where I was pretty close to that threshold, but not quite there, and so I was like, debating whether or not I should get something else to push over it, or maybe I should just not care. And uh, so he kind of talked me, though, into getting some Famicom games. Now, Famicom is dangerous, man. Famicom is, like, everywhere over there, and it's insane. It's an insane thing to try and collect. So I wasn't really planning to even touch it, but he talked me into getting a few of them. This is Doraemon. It's a, um, like, a platformer, but kind of a weird one. The same character from the N64 games, as mentioned before. This one I wanted just based on the cover art, because it really got my attention. This is Kyoshizu 2. Very, very strange. This one was actually pretty fun. This is a good uh, racing game. This is called Four-Wheel Drive Battle Clash. It obviously has a different name in Japanese, but um, yeah, that's, that's what it translates to. This was actually a fun one. And uh, this one is called 53 Stations of the Tokaido, which is like a weird... I want to call it a religious game, but it's not really. It's like a strange type of platformer as well. So, uh, yeah, four Famicom games. 
Now, onto these GameCube stacks. Yes, these are GameCube games. Now, if you're unfamiliar, uh, the GameCube in Japan uh, used, obviously, smaller cases. Uh, if you have the Game Boy player for the, the GameCube, then you know the shape of it. That's the same, you know, like the, the little disc that, that came in with the Game Boy player. That's the same thing they used, but they used it for all GameCube games. Um, I'm just guessing. The reason for that is over there, shelf space is more valuable, so to have smaller cases was nice. Whereas over here, it was perceived more as that would be like a child's toy. And Nintendo had enough of an image problem with the GameCube already that they didn't need to do that as well. I, in hindsight, I kind of wish they had done that here because, yeah, they take up less shelf space. It's kind of nice. But um, I decided to get a bunch of GameCube exclusives while I was there. Never set out to do that. Again, it was Book Off, man. The power of Book Off. It was just like, oh, these games are so fucking cheap. How could I not? <laughs> um, but yeah, I only picked up exclusives, and my ceiling for GameCube stuff was like 750 yen, which is, again, a little over 7 bucks, maybe just $7. Um, just because you just don't want to do, do go over, uh, over that much. Generally, they were within the 250 to 500 range, believe it or not. 750 again, was the ceiling, though. Uh, this one is some sort of uh, Naruto, Naruto 3 game. I don't remember which, but uh, there was a bunch of Naruto games that only came out there. This one surprised me that this existed. Nintendo Puzzle Collection. Um, I'm, it has some sort of GBA Link compatibility. I know there were bigger bundles that actually came with the GBA Link cable. So there's obviously games that support it. Uh, but it includes things like Dr. Mario, Yoshi's Cookie, and I don't recognize the third one. But uh, it's some other puzzle game. Um, the Mobile Suits Gundam Pilots Locus. Uh, these don't, obviously, that's like a literal translation that they put on the side here in English. Uh, if you look it up, you'll get better names for it. Uh, but yeah, some sort of Gundam game. Uh, this is Generation of Chaos Exceed uh, something. Super Robot Wars GC, which I assume GC stands for GameCube. One Piece Grand Battle 3. I'm, I'm not into One Piece or any anime, to be honest with you, but I found it odd that there were so many exclusive games like Naruto or uh, One Piece, because I know those are popular franchises, even over here, so for them to have exclusive games over there, I found kind of odd. <clears throat> Gift Pia. Kururin Squash. Dragon Drive G uh, D Masters Shot. Uh, the only thing I found interesting, I found two things interesting about this. It's a two disc game, sort of. One disc is the game, one disc is just like video. I think it's just episodes of the show or something like that. Um, I, when I looked it up to make sure I had the translation right, I actually found out this was widely panned as like one of the worst games of that generation. But that's why it never left Japan. It was supposed to, but then the release was so abysmal that they just. So it's just this GameCube exclusive for all time. Uh, this one I don't remember the name of offhand, I'll put it there, but it's basically a quiz-like game. Uh, it comes with the GameCube microphone, which is why the box is bigger. This is actually a super common, like, because the box is bigger, and because I don't think the game sold that well to begin with, you'll find this one a lot, and usually in really good shape, because nobody seemed to want it. There must have been a huge surplus of these. Oh, it says it in English. The Legend of Quiz Tournament of Champions. There you go. And it comes with the uh, the, the um, microphone. So if you want the microphone, this is probably actually the cheapest way to get it, is just to buy this particular bundle. Um, moving on. Charnico Hero, which looks like some sort of um, like little go-kart type of game, like a Mario Kart type of game. That actually really caught my interest, because those, obviously those are like the most playable. This I did not know existed. Uh, Donkey Konga 3. Uh, Donkey Kong 3 was an exclusive to Japan, never came out in North America or Europe for whatever reason. Um, funny enough, I don't have the first two, nor do I even have like the drums or anything, but since I knew this was exclusive, I was like, oh shit, I better get that. Um, honestly, don't remember the name of this one, I'll put it uh, in the description. I think, oh wait, Lost Treasure Under the Sea, that's the only part I can read. Yeah, I'll put the, the thing down there. This is a two-disc game. It's actually interesting to see the two-disc cases that they had for these smaller ones. They're a completely different structure, and they don't really hold the discs very well. Uh, Family Stadium 2003, some sort of baseball game. Uh, I believe that's like, that, there was Famista 64. I believe that's the exact same franchise. Um, from TV Animation, One Piece Treasure Battle. I'm pretty sure this is just One Piece Treasure Battle. But again, another exclusive game in that franchise on the cube over there. 
Jikyu Pawafuru, which probably means powerful. Puru Yakyu Ten, it's a baseball game. Uh, Konjiki no Gash Bell, yu -Oh Tag Battle Full Power. I think this game was released here, but only on the PlayStation 2. Legend of Golfer. When I was, <laughs> it's funny when you're like, so sometimes I make lists of like which games I have and stuff like that. And when I had to put this in the list, it was next to like Legend of Zelda. So I'm just like, oh, Legend of Zelda and Legend of Golfer. It just it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't quite compete. Uh, Mobile Suit Gundam versus Z Gundam. I'm fairly certain this also was released in North America, but only on the PlayStation 2. Uh, Bleach GameCube, based again on the, that show. This was made by Sega, actually, and it's kind of funny because it was never released here, unless this might have been released later on the Wii here, but on, as far as the GameCube is concerned, this is the only way to get it. And uh, Crockett, Banking no Kiki Wo Sukyu. I don't know. Looks like a platformer. Anyway, that's it for GameCube stuff. So I did pretty well on that, I think. Now this one, that next batch is funny, because I bought these games in total confidence that this was this was just going to be a thing. I don't, even, I don't even worry about this. Don't worry, man. These games are 250 yen a piece. They're like two bucks each. Just, just fucking do it. Just get them. You, 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 duh. These are Neo Geo CD games. Now the reason that sucks is I didn't end up getting a Neo Geo CD. So I have four games for this console that I don't own. But whatever, they were cheap, so one day when I have the console, I'll have a nice little library ready to go. This is Fatal Fury Special, King of Fighters 95, Fatal Fury 3, Road to the Final Victory, and Samurai Spirits, all of which I believe are fighting games, which is not really surprising, because that's like 98% of what's on that console. Um, but they're very import-friendly in that sense, because they you don't know, really require much in the way of language to play them. Um, but yeah, moving on, we also have a whole bunch of PlayStation 2 stuff. A console that everyone seems to think I hate, yet I buy stuff for it all the time, and you can't win. Uh, but this first one, I honestly don't remember the name of. It's a franchise that we've had over here, but not very often. Um, and this one we did not get for sure. I'll put the, again, I'll put the name down there. This one just caught my attention because it looked super Japanese, and it was only 108 yen, which is a dollar. So I was like, fuck, I'll just pick that up. It's minty fresh, it's clearly an exclusive, it's just amusing looking. I got it. Uh, this one I got solely for my other channel, for Game Society, and hopefully we do something with this. Um, this is CR something yellow cab, come on yellow cab, I don't know. It's like a, a game with all those like um, idle, Japanese idol models, and you're playing some sort of pachinko or something with them I don't, I don't know interestingly it comes with two discs and one of them is like a behind the scenes making of the game i don't know it's a, that, that second disc is actually a dvd it's not a ps2 formatted disc so that's interesting but yeah went ahead and got that this one i was excited to find sega rally 2006 this is actually a nice little bundle package this is uh, sega rally 2006 and it comes with a remake of sega rally 95 uh, all in one package. This was 500 yen. That's like four bucks for both of those. So I was, I was pretty cool. Um, Puyo Puyo Fever 2. Not only did I not know there was a Puyo Puyo Fever 2, I had no idea that it was only on the PlayStation 2. Uh, well, there was also a DS and a PSP version, but as far as consoles go, only the PS2. So I picked that up there. This one, I have a little bit of a funny story about. Um, so this is Seaman, which was, of course, a Dreamcast game. A very infamous Dreamcast game that they brought over here. Leonard Nimoy did the voice of it and everything. The sequel, Seaman 2, came out on the PlayStation 2 in Japan. Never came out anywhere else. Not a game that I think really translated well to Western audiences. So that's probably why they never did it. Um, and the sequel, the PS2 one, came with a weird, funky controller. And I thought, oh, that's cool. And then I saw that Seaman 1, I mean, I knew Seaman 1 had been re-released on the PS2 over there, but I didn't really care because I had the Dreamcast one, right? So then I saw this, and it was in a big box, and I was like, oh, shit. And turns out it comes with a funky, weird controller for Seaman 1. It is a USB-based controller. As far as, it's one of the few that I'm aware of on the PlayStation 2 where they actually used the USB ports specifically for controllers. Very strange. It obviously feels a lot more like a Dreamcast controller, which is no doubt intentional because the game was originally built for the Dreamcast. Um, now, the thing is, when I saw this, it just kind of amused me. And I was walking around a book-off that had two floors, right? 
So I put it in my bag, not my bag, I put it in my basket, like my cart thing, and I was, because it was super cheap. This thing was 250 yen, it's like two bucks, okay? And the reason it's so cheap is it's, well, first of all, it's not really worth anything to them, and it takes up a lot of real estate. You have to find out, you'll find that out in Japan, that things that are big are cheaper because they want to get rid of them. Um, so I, I, I put that in my basket and I walked up a flight of stairs to like the second floor of the store because that's where they kept all like the N64 cartridges and stuff. What I didn't realize is after I figured out all the ones I wanted, I brought my basket back down. My plan was to get down to the ground floor and just kind of reassess what I was actually going to keep and what I wasn't. Um, but I didn't notice when I walked from one floor to the other, I went through one of those like theft detector things and it started beeping and I wouldn't say going nuts, but you know, it was going off. And then immediately one of the employees just kind of walks over to me and she says something clearly indicating that she wanted my basket. So I just handed her the basket and then she immediately goes over and starts ringing everything up. And I was like, fuck, I didn't really have time to go through and be sure if I wanted everything in here, but I guess I'm buying it because none of it was like that expensive anyway. But um, yeah, that's kind of how I ended up with this thing. I wasn't totally sure if I was going to buy it because not that the, it was too much money or anything or not that it wasn't cool enough. It's just that at that point I was really, really running out of space for stuff. And this obviously took up a whole hell of a lot of real estate just because it's a big box. So whatever, I obviously got it back here so it all worked out. Now, onto the Sega Saturn. I did my best to avoid Sega Saturn stuff at all costs. Even though I love Sega stuff, and no one's going to accuse me of hating Sega for trying to avoid it, but even though I buy PlayStation stuff, everyone's going to hate me for it, so fucking whatever. But anyway, so, yeah, I when I was at, what, obviously I was at a book off, I was looking through the PS, I was looking through Saturn games, I think it was actually the same one. I was looking through the Saturn games, and it, usually they're super fucking cheap, but they're also usually sports games, or they're date sims, or they're anime stuff, like, not really that playable. So I'm going through and I, I catch, my eye catches this one. This is called um, Gaiken Muyo Anarchy in Nippon. Nippon means Japan, like referring to the country. Um, whereas Nihongo refers to Japanese, the language. You know, they have different words for each, separating each of those. Um, uh, but so I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, this doesn't look like an anime game. This actually looks like a game. It's a fighting game. It looks like a 3D rendered one. Um, it looks a lot graphically, uh, it looks a lot like uh, Dynamite Cop, or not Dynamite, Dynamite Decca, as they called it over there. We called it Die Hard Arcade. It looks a lot like that graphically. But it's clearly like a 2D fighting game. Um, so I thought, and it was 108 yen, which is a buck. So I was like, fuck, for a dollar, I'll pick this up and take a risk on it. Why not? The problem with Saturn over there, man, is it is way too prevalent. Way too prevalent. I mentioned this before, but once again, we had 244 Saturn games in North America. Europe had around the same thing. You combine all the games we had across the board with each other, you were maybe talking 280 games, like maximum. Japan had alone 1,400 plus exclusives, not even including that other like 280 games. You could put me in a room in Japan with nothing but every single Sega Saturn game ever released and say, here's your two suitcases you brought, they're completely empty, here's your backpack, here's your laptop case. You have the right to fill everything you have up with nothing but Sega Saturn games for free, and you can take them all out of here. You would not make a dent in that room. There is just too many fucking Sega Saturn games to even approach it. That's why I avoided it mostly. So of course my next pickup is a Sega Saturn game. This one came as a recommendation from James, uh, he said that this game was really good, so I'm trusting him on it. It's a fighting game called Rabbit. Now, um, this was about 15 bucks. Now, I looked online, it usually sells for like 50 and Granted, that's because you're importing it. This is book off and stuff, which this one exceeded my financial rule, but I, I went with his recommendation, especially when I looked it up online and found out how much more it goes for. It's a 2D fighting game. It's actually a pretty well-received one based on the reviews I read. But the other thing that's interesting about it is that EA made it. And that's strange because they didn't release it anywhere other than Japan. EA doesn't usually do that, but uh, they did in this case. Uh, next up, I got one of the games I had been looking for. Like, this was, when I went to Japan, I actually surprisingly didn't have, like, a long list of things I knew I wanted to get. But this was on it, the short list of things I knew I wanted to get. This is Tokidoki Idol Panic for the Famicom Disk System. 
Now I have a Famicom Disk System, but it doesn't work because it needs a replacement belt and I've, I lack the skill to install it, even though I actually have a replacement belt, I just can't put it in myself. Um, so I, I, ha I can't actually even play this. But if you're not familiar with Tokidoki Idle Panic, basically the story with it is that uh, in the mid-80s, after Super Mario Brothers had come out, um, in Japan there was some sort of festival in which Nintendo had a conjunction with some sort of TV network, and I believe these characters were part of that network. And Nintendo was basically making a game with those characters to celebrate whatever that festival was. It was like a one-time thing nobody ever really thought about. And then what happened eventually is that after Mario Brothers was a big hit, in Japan they decided to make Super Mario Brothers 2. But when Nintendo of America got a hold of that game, they were like, this is impossible, this game's way too hard, and it's exactly the same as the first game, it's just really, really hard. They thought American and probably European audiences would completely reject the game, and could potentially kill the Mario franchise just as it was going. So they looked into the catalog of other Nintendo titles, they found Tokidoki Idle Panic, and they thought, we reskin this, put Mario characters in it, that's Super Mario Bros. 2. So essentially, this is Super Mario Bros. 2 for the NES with completely different characters. Um, because of that, it's sought after by collectors. A lot of people want it. I was seeing it in places like Super Potato for like 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Uh, but one of the book offs I went to, again, it was the same one actually where I got Seaman. They have three copies of this shit for like 10 bucks each. Now, I'm not greedy. I just got one for myself. But um, yeah, I, I was really happy to find this. Now, of course, there's always the possibility that the actual game is not on there. That would be sad. Problem with Super, uh, with Famicom Disk System games is they're intended to be rewritable. The idea was that you would buy one and then you could take it to a store and like write over it. Um, so I'm just kind of trusting that the game is actually on there, but I don't know. I have no way to know that. This one's in really good condition. It has all like the, the original stickers on it. The other ones didn't. So I'm just hoping that whoever had this decided never to write over it with anything, but. I have no way of being sure at the moment. Either way, I've got it. I'm happy. Um, next up, I got a Sega Mega Drive game. The only one I picked up while I was over there. This is Ringside Angel, or more accurately, whatever the hell the full title is that I'm putting here on the screen. Um, yeah, this, this I, again, I like Super Famicom. I kind of went over there thinking, like, eh, I don't really want to get too into this because it's there's too many games I'm unfamiliar with, and it's too hard of a thing to collect. But this one obviously caught my eye because of the, the lenticular cover there and how it like changes like that. And uh, so what it basically is, is one of these like idle games, like that PS2 game, except this one is obviously for the Mega Drive Genesis, you know, it's 16 bits, it's not exactly hot. <laughs> but, um, but basically it's just a wrestling game featuring those girls, which I found amusing. Um, it was like 250 yen, I think, again, it's like two bucks. And I was like, I should get at least one Mega Drive game. It's in perfect condition, you know, it's complete everything and it smells like Japan it's weird if you if you ever import Japanese products and you open the box you will notice this scent I don't know what it is it obviously has something to do with plastic but their plastic smells ridiculously different than ours and I don't know why but the inside of this case smells exactly like Japan for lack of a better word um, now I also got something I was not expecting to find this is an OG Xbox controller. This was, again, actually this is again the same book off where I got C-Man. Um, I saw this in the hard parts section, again, where they sell like hardware and stuff, controllers, that kind of thing, which makes perfect sense. 500 yen, it's about four bucks. And I didn't think much of it at first. I was like, oh, all right, that's an OG Xbox controller. I put it in the basket. That was one of those things, put the lotion in the basket, put the controller in the basket. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, I put, it, I put it in there thinking, like, yeah, maybe I'll get it or whatever. And then I ended up getting it through awkward pressure. But um, I'm really glad I did because it kind of occurred to me later what this actually is. So you guys, little history lesson if you don't remember, if you weren't around. When the OG Xbox launched here, we had a bigger controller called the Duke. Um, it was not a really popular controller. In Japan, they didn't even try to launch with that controller. They launched with this, this gray one. Um, now this controller was actually really well designed, people really liked it, and in fact a lot of people who really liked the Xbox were importing these controllers back to the States. And, uh, or maybe even Europe and Canada as well, I'm not totally sure, but I, I grew up in the States, That's so I know a lot of people were doing it here. Um, but, uh, yeah, so a lot of people were liking this controller, and eventually of course Microsoft noticed, and after like a year they decided to just, you know, bring this controller over themselves. They did it in black, and that's the extent of it as far as I thought until I actually held this. 
I didn't realize in Japan, after about a year, they switched it over to black. So the gray ones were only about out for about a year. And the gray ones are different. Uh, they're different in the fact that the plastic is textured. It's like a matte finish. It's actually much nicer, much nicer plastic. And I can see now why people were importing these. The other thing that's different about it, though, is the buttons, the X, Y, A, B buttons. Um, they're obviously in the same place and all that, but they're textured. On the original one, or at least the ones we had, it was like one solid piece of plastic, and you, even though you could see the letters, you couldn't feel the letters. This one, the letters are engraved. You can feel them. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm not sure if that's actually helpful or a distraction, but it is noticeably different. So um, this was definitely cool to actually have. I didn't realize it would be as cool until I actually opened it and tried using it. It's definitely cool to have that, especially as someone who really likes the OG Xbox. Um, now, we got a couple more pickups, some of the stuff off screen, but I'm going to show you the last game pickup. Are you ready? This is something special. Something really special, and it really fucking shouldn't be special. It should be stupid. But this is what it is. Skylanders Spyro's Adventure for the Wii U. You're like, I'm going to unsub now. No, hang on. Seriously, this is actually interesting. I don't give a fuck about Skylanders. <laughs> I never did. I'm an adult. Um, but Skylanders, you would think it would be worthless, right? It's something that comes out everywhere, and it's always in bargain bins a matter of months later, you know? Um, but as a collector, it's one of those things you just kind of have to get to check it off the list if you're going for a full set. Well, I want to credit my buddy Julian from Canada with this one. He discovered, and I, you know, I might as well give him full credit for it because it seems like nobody in the West knew this thing was real, including me. He discovered there was a, a Skylanders game called Skylanders Spyro's Adventure, which did come out here, just on different platforms. It came out on like the Wii, the 360, the PS3, Xbox One, PS4, etc. But the Wii U version apparently was either digital only or didn't happen. But in Japan, it got a physical edition, which sounds fine. It's like, okay, great. They got a, one of those weird physical editions that we didn't get. Who cares? What's the big deal? The big deal is that this game was only released at like a convention or an event or something like that. As a result, it's extraordinarily uncommon. Yeah, really. There is a really rare, impossibly hard Skylanders game to find. And it's this. The Wii U edition of Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. Now it gets worse because I, I found this at a book off when I was with James. And I, you can, you know, if he comments in the video, he'll, he'll, he'll prove my point. Uh, it had a big note on it. And he couldn't quite read the note because he said the handwriting was sloppy. But I was like, what it probably says is that it comes with the toys or it doesn't come with the toys. I was actually, at the time, very hopeful it didn't come with the toys because I was like, I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to take up that space but fucking it came with the toys. So I have the toys for this thing. This is why it's cheap. The thing was 900 yen for this whole set. Again, that's like eight and a half bucks. Like that's nothing um, for something this, this exceedingly rare. But at the same time, this shit isn't worth anything yet. Do you know why? Because nobody knows it's real. Until this thing, I actually saw it. I was not convinced it was actually a, a, really in existence. I Googled this thing a bunch. There was like one stock photo on the internet that looked like a marketing team made it. Not anybody being like, it's here. Well, here I am, everybody. I'm sorry to say, Wii U collectors, this fucking thing is real. And the problem with that is that it's, because it was some limited, rare, hard to find release, it's hard to fucking find. But it's not worth a damn, so don't overpay for it, at least not yet. But the reason it's not worth shit is because nobody knows about it, including the Japanese. They don't care about this thing because it's huge, as I mentioned with Seaman. They don't like big stuff like this. This shit becomes worthless. So a lot of these things are probably being tossed or gotten rid of entirely. So I don't know. I don't know. I tried looking for this everywhere I went in Japan. Everywhere. Every single Wii U section I looked for this. I found it once and I bought it. One time. That's it. And I've looked online, there are some e Amazon JP sellers, Amazon.co.jp, that are selling this. None of them will ship to the States. I tried. And they're charging a lot more than this, because at least they're kind of aware of what it is. So I am sorry, Wii U collectors, this fucking piece of shit is real. I am sorry. Now, <laughs> with that out of the way, let's move on. Uh, we have a couple of other items. First up, we have... A Famicom, an AV Famicom, in the box. This is interesting. If you guys aren't aware, the AV Famicom... Uh, so in Japan, the Famicom is the NES, as mentioned before. But 
Over there, the Famicom only had RF out, and the Famicom was super popular. Composite was taken off with TVs, and Nintendo decided, okay, well, let's re-release the Famicom, but give you AV, composite, so that the picture quality is better. And they released this. Does this look familiar to you? This is the same body type as the top loader NES. The great irony in that is that when Nintendo released this in North America for the top loader NES, they removed the composite that was actually on the NES and only gave you RF. They did exactly the opposite of what Japan did. Um, so for years, this has been the best way to play NES games in North America because it's reliable, because it's a top load uh, design, but it's also got composite out. You, what you'd have to do is get like a, like a, uh, a Famicom to NES adapter, very easy to do, and you just connect it in there and your games would run, no problem. So for years, that's what everyone was doing. These things were worth a shit ton of money on that basis. But I was wandering around and I first saw one in the box. It was like 120 bucks and I was like, oh, maybe I should get it because they're so fucking rare. I was thinking about the old system of like how much they used to be worth. And then I started noticing them everywhere. That's cheap. That's cheap. That's cheap. Why are they so cheap? And it didn't take long to deduce. The, there's a few reasons for that. RGB mods are obviously taking off now. Uh, there's way more clone consoles. Even there, you were seeing a lot of clone consoles of the Famicom. Um, ones that look a lot like the Famicom, like they don't hide it, and they call themselves like Famicom HDMI, stuff like that. But they're just clone consoles, they're not made by Nintendo. Uh, and as a result, a lot of people who had AV Famicoms, getting rid of them. So they're not really worth anything anymore. So I got this one in the box for about 70 bucks, which I would argue I might have even overpaid. <laughs> given how, like, I probably could have got a loose one for less, but for, with the box, it has the manual, it has two controllers, doesn't have composite cables, doesn't have a power cable, not a big deal. The composite output is actually the exact same one that the SNES, the N64, and GameCube use, so I got tons of those sitting around. And the power supply, um, I have universal power cables, not like shitty Chinese ones. I've got ones like the Retro DC that a buddy of mine made. I did a video on it a long time ago. A universal power supply, oh, it's fucking great. You can plug like any retro console into it. It's fucking awesome. But anyway, it works perfectly with this. And uh, I tested it out, yeah, thing works perfectly great. I was thinking if you want me to, I could do a cleaning video. It doesn't really need it, but I can at least show you the steps. And if you guys like the idea of just seeing a breakdown of it, I'd be happy to do it. But yeah, I got myself an AV Famicom. And now, everyone, the moment you've potentially all been waiting for, the piece de resistance of this whole thing, the number one pickup that I got on this trip, at least from a financial perspective, it may not at first look all that exciting. I'm building it up too much, so now I'm trying to settle you back down. But it may not look all that exciting at first, but let me explain this one. Okay, this is so exciting, I didn't even take this out of the plastic wrap because I wanted you to see it with the price tag on it. Are you ready? Here we go. It's a white GameCube. All right, see you later. No, this is exciting. Okay, seriously, this is exciting. Now, you'll notice it is a white GameCube, has a white Game Boy player, has a controller, has the power supply, has the cables, uh, has the Game Boy Player software with it. Now, the price of this was 2,950 yen. That's around 28 bucks, maybe even 27. Okay, Adam, I'm starting to lose interest. I'm gonna unsub. Just chill, why the unsub? Just leave the video. Relax, buddy, relax. No, this is good. The reason this is good is I saw this and I was like, oh, okay, a white GameCube. I don't see those very often. Europe got a white GameCube, it was like a sports bundle. This is not the same one. This is um, like a pearl white, something like that. And there's a very specific, it's crystal white, I'm sorry, crystal white. Pearl white was the name of the European one. Crystal white GameCube. The reason this is exciting is the crystal white GameCube was a Final Fantasy bundle. And it's, you know what? Fuck it, I'm gonna ruin the surprise. Look at this picture. You see the price tag of that? That's the last one of these that sold. Look at the fucking price of that. It's like $1,000. The difference between mine and that one is that one had the box, yes. And that one's in slightly less yellowed condition. This one is yellowed a bit, I can fix that. Now obviously mine doesn't have the box. But as it turns out, this is a super fucking rare limited edition console. According to everything I've read about it, only 150 of these were made. What? <laughs> and I found one at a book off for 28 bucks. Again, granted, mine doesn't have the box and it's yellow. I can fix the yellowing though. But uh, yeah, that's fucking astonishing. So this, this costs virtually nothing by comparison of what it's worth. 
Now obviously after the video is over, I'm going to open it up, test it out, all that fun stuff. Uh, maybe I'll clean it up. I'll do retro writing on it eventually, that takes forever with a GameCube, but I will do it. Um, I'll even leave a little annotation there to let you know if it worked. I bet it worked. Did it work? I bet it worked. Um, but yeah, man. Blown away. Because obviously it came with the Game Boy Player, it came with the software, and it's, it's just... That's fucking amazing to me, to actually find that. Like, from a financial perspective, far and away. Far and away the best pickup of the entire trip. I mean, if I were to sell it, pays for a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's insanity. Um, so whatever, that's, that's super exciting and uh, really glad to have it. Even though it's, it was kind of, there was a, a, a certain, okay, this is first world problems to the nth degree. But, um, you know, I was, the, you saw it earlier in the video, I don't know who caught it, but uh, I was actually considering not getting it only because of the amount of space it would take up in my bag and it would mean I couldn't do other things. Because fundamentally, it's just a GameCube, but it's just a really fucking rare GameCube. So ultimately, obviously, I did it, but there was that moment where I was like, Eh, it's gonna take up too much suitcase space. I don't know. You know. Obviously, I made the smart choice. I think, but um, yeah, man, really happy to have that. That's fucking cool as shit. Uh, eventually, I'll probably do some sort of rare variants video on this thing after I've de-yellowed it and all that shit whenever I have time. So, whatever. Anyway, guys, that was book off, and that was Japan. I hope you've enjoyed this series and all these stores. I hope you enjoyed seeing all these absurd, ridiculous things. If you want me to do that video, that live stream on like. Japanese tips on buying stuff in stores and all that fun stuff. Let me know. I'd be happy to do it. Anyway, guys, uh, once again, I want to thank James for his involvement in all this, and I want to thank you guys for watching. I will see you all later.